We are very lucky to have with us live in the studios this morning, Deborah Nelson. Deborah Nelson is the Carnegie Visiting Professor at the University of Maryland College of Journalism. She was previously an investigative reporter at the Los Angeles Times, Washington Post, Seattle Times, and Chicago Sun-Times. She won the Pulitzer Prize for investigative reporting in 1997 and was a project editor on Pulitzer Prize winning investigations in 2001 and 2002. In 2006, she and military historian Nicholas Terse co-authored a series on U.S. war crimes for the Los Angeles Times. She currently serves on the board of the Fund for Investigative Journalism and the advisory board of the Investigative Reporting Workshop. And she is here to talk about her new book, The War Behind Me, Vietnam Veterans Confront the Truth About U.S. War Crimes. Start out and tell us what was the motivation in writing your book, The War Behind Me? Well, to explain that, I think you have to understand what's in this incredible records collection. Um, the War Behind Me is based on declassified collection of U.S. war crime reports that the Pentagon compiled during the Vietnam War and kept secret. Uh, many of them egregious accounts of murder, massacre, torture, uh, destruction of villages. Hundreds of reports were confirmed, but the findings were kept under wraps until 1990, when they were quietly declassified at the National Archives. But um, nobody discovered them until uh, the early 2000s, when a handful of historians and journalists were tipped to them by specialists at the archives. Um, one of them was Nick Terse, who is a military scholar from University of Columbia. He did his dissertation on the, on the records. And it occurred to him that some of the cases that he was writing about, in particular a massacre of 19 people, might be newsworthy even this many years later. Um, the massacre was reported by a Californian. So he contacted the, the uh, Los Angeles Times and his email was forwarded to me. Uh, I was Washington investigative editor at the time, at the Los Angeles Times. Um, and I, when I received his email, I've got to be honest, that I wasn't immediately persuaded I had a hard time justifying pouring my time and the LA Times resources into investigation of atrocities that happened 30 and 40 years earlier when we were in Iraq and Afghanistan, which both needed more investigating um, and really still do. But Nick's email mentioned this large body of records that these cases came out of. And as I waded into it, I realized I really couldn't justify not doing it. Um, I mean, here was a chance to set the record straight on an emotional issue that had divided our generation for decades, and as recently as 2004, during the presidential campaign, um, the Swift voters at attacked John Kerry for his 1971 testimony as a Vietnam veteran that war crimes were day-to-day -day occurrences. And they very effectively attacked him, in fact. Um, so. And, and, and when, we, when we entered these records, the information in the records in a database, in fact, we found that um, every major division in Vietnam was represented, that, in fact, war crimes weren't isolated incidents committed by a few rogue units as the military um, had, had, has represented up until this day. And as I think the popular uh, public perception is that My Lai was, when you talk about war crimes, people know about My Lai and not much else. Uh, but what these records showed is that, in fact, uh, war crimes were a significant problem in Vietnam. Who put these records together, and what was their motivation in doing so? The uh, records were compiled after Cy Hirsch exposed the My Lai Massacre. Um, after his expose, Nixon told his military leaders that he wanted the army off the front page. The General Westmoreland, who by then was chief of staff of the army, um, had his staff uh, assigned a special task force on his staff to compile any reports of war crimes so that they'd have an early warning system, so they would know if there were any other potential scandals lurking out there. So they gathered up reports from um, the Army investigators, the Criminal Investigation Division, from uh, any reports that might appear on the inside pages of a paper, uh, reports that were going across the desk of a congressman. They compiled those those records. They kept statistical um, information on them. They had stats that went up the chain of command every month on how many cases had been reported and what their status was. But the purpose of this was not to stop um, atrocities. It wasn't to punish 
the perpetrators. It was simply to be ready, if asked, to be able to say, oh, yes, we know about that. It's under investigation. And to do, work their hardest to make it go away and to keep it off the front pages. So, And this is, in the words of, you know, this isn't a conclusion I'm drawing. This is, this is from the words of the people who were compiling the records. This is their, their explanation of what, what, why they were doing what they were doing. By the time they finished, five years after this effort started, there were 9,000 pages of records that included witness um, accounts, uh, suspect interviews, statistical reports, and memoranda going up and down the chain of command from the battlefield to the White House. And did the records indicate that those responsible for these atrocities were held accountable? No. In fact, they showed quite the opposite. Um, after we entered the information in the database, we found that at least 300 allegations had been confirmed, yet only a handful resulted in, in court martials. Fourteen people went to prison total out of that entire um, collection of records, out of 300 confirmed cases. And most of those were for a year or less, for crimes as serious as murder. There are 500 other allegations that were uh, not confirmed, that were labeled unsubstantiated, but a closer look found that at least a quarter of those had actually been confirmed, but were mislabeled as unconfirmed for various reasons. For example, if, um, if somebody had, uh, if customs officials found a skull or an ear in uh, a package sent home, they couldn't, and they couldn't prove that the soldier who was sending it home had actually removed it from the body, they would label, label it as an unconfirmed report of corpse mutilation. Well, somebody had, of course, removed it from the corpse. But as a result of that, um, today you'll, you'll find that there's this perception that reports of U.S. troops mutilating, mutilating corpses and wearing ears, ear necklaces was phony, was false, was made up. In fact, it wasn't. That happened quite regularly. By quite regularly, I, I, I don't mean to say that most veterans were doing it. But many uh, recalled that members of their unit did. Talk about some of the individual stories of the soldiers that either participated in these atrocities or witnessed these atrocities when they tried to report these uh, properly. Well, chapter one begins with um, Jamie Henry, uh, who reported the massacre of, of 19 women and children in Quang Nam province. His company, on February 8, 1968, entered a small hamlet um, populated just with women and children and one old man. They were rounded up. The platoon leader radioed the captain and said, what should I do with them? The captain said, you know what the operation order is. And according to witnesses, more than a dozen, he said, kill anything that moves. The lieutenant, according to witnesses, and according to the records that we have, um, sought volunteers and did just that. Jamie Henry, a medic in the company, didn't participate in that, but he witnessed it. He, as soon as he got back to the United States, while still in the Army, he tried to report it. But the Army lawyer he was interviewed by called him a liar. And so he did nothing more with it until he left the Army. Then he went public with it. He held a press conference with the help of Vietnam veterans against the war in Los Angeles received a couple inside stories, and then it just disappeared. Now, the Army inter finally interviewed him at that point after his press conference, and now it's 1970. Um, and he, he gave him a 10-page account of what happened, including the massacre and including a number of murders that led up to that massacre over a five-month period. Um, and then they just went away. And as far as he knew, they never did anything with it. But in fact, Unbeknownst to him or anybody else, they kept, they continued with a three and a half year investigation where they interviewed 100 members of his company and confirmed that the massacre happened. But then they did nothing with it. They closed the case. They prosecuted nobody and never told him or the public that they had confirmed it. Is that the case where you and uh, Nicholas Terse eventually put the, gave him copies of the files that you came across? Yeah, we showed up at his door in the fall of 2005 um, with the entire file. 
And over the next two days, we went through the file with him, and he was astonished to see the amount of work that the Army had done on, his, on this case. And, you know, he was happy to see that so many of members of his company had told the truth when investigators came to them and asked them for it, that they had backed them up. I can't say he was surprised to see that the Army ultimately covered it up. Um, that, didn't, that did not take him by surprise. What was interesting is that um, two days after, or about a week after we had interviewed him, he sent us an email that, um, that described his reaction to having this, you know, to, this case that he had put away in a closet, um, to have the, that closet door reopened. And can I read the email to you? Mm -hmm. It really, um, really describes, I think, what a lot of the men went through when we approached them this many years later about such a traumatic incident. He wrote, after you guys left, I was very distressed. I just sat in my chair physically shaking for about an hour. I was reliving all of that and the thought of bringing all of that up again and going through all of that all over again, and my mind just raced in a million directions all at the same time. Fear was involved in a lot of it. When Patty, that's his wife, got up, she could see that I was in trouble. And she never really said anything, just handed me a handwritten note that said, our lives begin to end the day we become silent about things that matter. Martin Luther King Jr. I carried that in my pocket all week and read it often. That helped. It didn't take me back to being 23 years old and bulletproof, but it helped me get through my thick head that what was right then is right now. That became a real inspiration to me for... Whenever I stopped to think, now, why am I doing this? I'd pull out that note from Jamie, and it reminded me that whenever the truth reveals itself, we've got to write about it, whether it's three days or three decades. Talk a bit about Lieutenant Colonel Anthony B. Herbert. Anthony Herbert's case was one of the fairly well-known cases uh, from the Vietnam War. He accused the Army of covering up uh, war crimes at the at torture and murder of detainees. Uh, he, reported, he reported them, he said he, he reported him, them when he was in Vietnam and the, that the Army retaliated by removing him from his command um, and, not, and not taking him serious, not, not investigating his allegations. He went public with the allegations and the Army began a public campaign to discredit him. Um, in fact, the Army's own investigation showed that seven of his, I think it's seven of his, um, of the allegations he reported, in fact, occurred, in, including the murder of um, eight detainees. Um, yet, they persisted in putting out public releases that said that most of his allegations weren't true and that he was exaggerating and lying about what he saw. In fact, not only did the Army's investigation find that he was telling the truth, about some very significant allegations of atrocities, of torture of detainees by the 173rd Airborne Brigade. Uh, but they came they tripped across a much bigger problem with torture. In fact, um, torture using water rag, an early version of waterboarding, and field phones to deliver an electric shock was used routinely over a two-year period by interrogators at the 173rd Airborne uh, Brigade. And, and um, not only used routinely on um, enemy combatants, but on, on civilians. Because many of the detainees brought in for questioning were civilians, farmers brought in from the fields. The Army confirmed that that happened. They got suspects to confess. Yet, once again, they told no one, and they prosecuted no one. The case was just filed away and kept secret until um, we came across it. And was he also uh, one of the people you had contact with after you came across the, the files? Yes, absolutely. And, and uh, he was, he of course uh, knew about the significant problems there were at the 173rd Airborne, and he spent his life trying to get people to believe him. Uh, to believe what he said. The Army very effectively um, paint portrayed him as somebody who um, was a liar and traitor, when in fact 
He was he was a truth teller. He told he told what really happened. But beyond him, he's the one he's the one that uh, I think the public remembers because he his case was a really a celebrity case. He was he was on uh, the Dick Cavett show making his allegations, and the army had a lot of public relations machinery. Um, they put a lot of resources, an enormous amount of resources, into, into discrediting him. And so while all that was happening, playing out on a public stage, behind the scenes they were corroborating this incredible, um, extensive case of torture uh, by the 173rd Airborne Division. And there were some men in that interrogators, about a dozen interrogators in that group who had tried to report the routine use of torture in the 1980s. When they reported that they sent letters to the inspector general. A representative of the inspector general's office came to the base and accused them and threatened them with court martial. So they they became they went they went silent. A few of them after they returned to the United States, like Jamie Henry, reported um, uh, held press conferences to report that this was happening, but they weren't believed either. And in fact, their case, their allegations show up in the unconfirmed cases in the files even though the Army later confirmed that, in fact, the torture had taken place, and it had taken place repeatedly in more than 100 incidents. Was uh, Robert Stemme, was he one of the people involved in that? Yeah, he was one of the uh, dozen uh, members of that unit of the, in, of the interrogation, the military um, intelligence detachment who wrote letters to the inspector general to try to stop the torture. They talked about... Um, about the screams from the interrogation huts, keeping them awake at night. And uh, what's interesting is that when I contacted the commander to ask what he knew, to say, you know, the, this, these methods were being used, electric shock, water rig, on a regular basis by the men under you. Why didn't you stop it? He claimed that he didn't know. And I said, well, the men talk about the screams keeping them awake at night. Didn't you hear the screams? And he said, well, I, you know, I slept in a unit with an air conditioner. I really couldn't hear much at night other than the occasional friendly arty. You also write about a particular general who was in charge of some of the investigations and his connections to what John Kerry said in the 2004 campaign. General John Johns uh, was one of the people who in the early 1970s, was assigned to that task force to collect, to compile the war crime records, um, and he helped keep them secret. Uh, but after the war, long after the war, after we went into Iraq, well, let me back up for a second. During the 2004 election, uh, when John Kerry was running and being attacked by the Swift boaters, John Johns, who thought for a long time that these records should be kept secret, that the Army would take care of its own problem, he had a change of heart. And he contacted the Kerry campaign to let them know that, in fact, there were records over at the National Archives that existed that would show that he was telling the truth when he testified in 1971 that war crimes were day-to-day -day occurrences. He called the campaign three times. Nobody ever called back. Well, a, a year later, we contacted him and sat down with him. And um, he said that he did, at the, t at the time that he compiled these records, he really did believe that, uh, that the Army would take care of them, that we, they should be kept secret because letting the information out would hurt the Army. And then the Army was in the best position to fix these problems. But he said when we went to war in Iraq that he changed his mind because he couldn't believe that our country would enter into another counterinsurgency operation that would result in, in his mind, you know, from, based on his experience, would almost certainly lead to civilian killings, similar to in Vietnam. Uh, that he couldn't believe that we, were, that, we were gonna, that we did that. And he felt that at that point, people really needed to know the arm, that the Army had not learned its lessons from Vietnam and that the public needed to know what happened so that they would put pressure on the government to um, stop the war. So it kind of begs the question, do you think atrocities like those that were carried out by U.S. forces uh, are inevitable in a war like Vietnam or in Iraq? Well, now, if you talk to John Johns, the retired general I was just speaking of, uh, he would tell you yes. And now he wrote the 
counterinsurgency manual um, for the Vietnam War. And at that time, when doing that, he came to believe that war crimes are inevitable. So that when these reports of civilian killings uh, were coming across his desk, he wasn't surprised. His theory is that um, any time a foreign force goes into a country in, in, in a counterinsurgency operation where um, they're fighting in populated areas and they're fighting an enemy that's hard to identify, you're going to end up with civilian killings. Soldiers will become frustrated and they'll take out those frustrations on the civilians around them. And when that happens, the, the population will lose faith in the U.S., and they'll, they'll, they'll inter they'll, they, will, they will start supporting the insurgency. It'll drive them away from us. And if that happens, we can't win. In counterinsurgency operations, you need popular support in order to win. And um, civilian killings do quite the opposite. So his belief is that atrocities are inevitable, that we should never enter into a counterinsurgency operation unless it's absolutely necessary, unless it's the very last resort, because we'll lose, civilians will be killed, we'll lose local support, we'll lose moral standing, and we'll ultimately lose the battle. However, I, that said, um, in talking to some of the men like Jamie Henry, they insist that uh, there are ways to at least minimize, reduce the number of, of civilian uh, war crimes and civilian killings. Um, first of all, you know, there are policies that start from the top that encourage civilian killings, uh, such as body count. You know, that the idea of measuring success by enemy body count led to the killing of, intentional killing of civilians to increase the body count in Vietnam. Enemy body count was again used in Iraq. And in fact, in a, a case involving snipers killing, um, killing civilians, uh, that, that led to court-martial, some of the soldiers talk about body count pressure as being one of the motivations, one of the influences. Um, there are a lot of policies that come from the top that encourage civilian killings that could, could be changed. The notion of, uh, in the, of um, using artillery and airstrikes in populated areas the, that, that leads to significant civilian casualties. It did in Vietnam, and it is again in Afghanistan right now. We're seeing uh, we have a, you know, a military strategy that relies heavily on airstrikes in populated areas. And according to Human Rights Watch, we've seen the number of civilian casualties due to those airstrikes double in the last couple of years. On the ground, um, Jamie Henry talks about the lack of completely complete failure of leadership on the ground. Where in, um, in his case, for example, leading up to the massacre, men killed a, a pig for sport. They shot at water buffalo for sport. Then they killed a little boy who crossed their path. And then they, they shot at a man for an old man for target practice. In each of these cases, there was no report made. Nobody was prosecuted. Nobody was even reprimanded. If the leaders on the ground had acted quickly when men began to, um, when men showed signs of strain and started to act out against civilians, we would have prevented a lot more, uh, a lot of the civilian killings. So with good, le stronger leadership on the ground and more ethical uh, policies, military strategy policies from above, you can al at least reduce the number of war crimes, they would argue. And the men, I, I found that the men on the ground were outraged at the idea that, were actually insulted at the notion that you can't prevent war crimes because they, they said, we didn't do it. Um, and many men did not, most of the men who served in Vietnam did not commit war crimes. And they were angry that there wasn't stronger leadership to prevent those who did commit them um, from doing it again. And it seemed like a repeating pattern that a lot of the participants indicated that the orders came from above, that, you know, this was expected to do this. You were expected to do this. Sometimes it was very, sometimes the orders were very direct, such as in the case of um, the massacre, where, you know, the operation order of the day was kill anything that moves. Um, sometimes they were more indirect. The order was, we need a higher enemy body count. We want results. 
and unless you give us results, we're not going to give you air support. Or if you give us results, you'll get R and R next month. There was a heavy pressure to turn to to uh, deliver an enemy body count, and as a result, you had members, uh, commanders, sending their men out and saying, "Bring back some dead enemy." And if they couldn't find any, they brought back dead civilians in the hundreds, you know, in, in the thousands. It seemed, though, also in, in terms of those who had participated in the torturing, that, that it was kind of understood in a lot of the cases they were uh, very upset that they were being singled out and the people above them were getting off scot-free. They're very, yes. It, and in the torture cases, you also saw pressure from above um, on, for a body count of sorts. They talked about being expected uh, and some of their commanders actually explained this, that their performance reviews depended on uh, how many people were brought in and interrogated. And so there was pressure on the uh, military units to round up people um, and call them you know, potential suspects and bring them in for interrogation when, in fact, they were just civilians. And when they came in for interrogation, they were subjected to uh, water torture, electric torture, and beatings. The files that you based all this on, are they still available at the uh, National Archives? They are, but um, many of them, a a few years ago, the National Archives removed many of them from the public shelves uh, because they discovered that they had not redacted them properly, that there was private information left in them, such as Social Security numbers. Um, The problem is that they they did not set up any uh, plan to restore them to the public shelves, to redact them, restore them to the public shelves. They said they would do it on a case-by-case basis um, on individual requests. So right now, some of the files are back on the public shelves as a result of me or other people putting in Freedom of Information Act requests, but many of them remain um, off limits. So it sounds like we could help out by doing individual FOIA requests for those files to get them back out into the public domain? that individual, file re- individual FOIA requests would um, go a long way in getting them out back on the public shelves. And um, the more the better, because the more requests there are, the higher up, the, the faster they'll get to it. If there are you know, four or five requests for one particular file, that may move it up, um, inter- um, move it up the waiting list. And you actually have a listing of the files in the back of your book. The files are listed in the back of my book. Um, the FOIA request can be, fi- can be followed, uh, excuse me, filed through uh, archives.gov, www.archives.gov. is the National Archives website. Um, you can file it electronically, and what you would ask for is um, the Vietnam War Crimes Working Group records, Record Group 319, and the list of cases is in the back of the book. So if anybody out there felt so moved, they could request one or two or three of those cases. Or five or six. Or five or six. <laughs> I mean, the more the merrier. And, um, and mention, you, you, you would mention the case number. You'd mention Record Group 319 and the Vietnam War Crimes Working Group. So is there, uh, is there an email they could uh, forward this info to once they, so that, you know, you would be able to keep abreast of the different requests and where they are lacking? Yes, um, the war behind me at yahoo.com. That's All right. the war behind me at yahoo.com. And if an individual files a FOIA request, uh, that opens those records for everybody. So yeah. it would be a tremendous public we service to get these records, which have been kept secret for most of the last 30 years, um, out there and available to the public. The, the lessons learned that soldiers had tried to pass on 40 years ago and were shouted down are in those files. And I think m- now more than ever, um, they need to be passed on. Because unless we acknowledge what happened in Vietnam, we're, I think we're condemned to repeat it. Well, with that, we are unfortunately out of time. I want to thank you very much for spending time with us this morning. Well, thank you. We've just been talking with Deborah Nelson. She is author of the new book, The War Behind Me. Vietnam veterans confront the truth about U.S. war crimes. And again, you can find out more about the book at the website, thewarbehindme.com.
www.thepetshow.com.